and I've entitled this series and specifically this message with a simple statement, I need you. And for some of you, you may be thinking, well, is he talking about God, about Jesus? And yes, of course. But actually most of this message is focused on the fact that we need each other. I need you in my life. And whether you like it or not, some of you need me in your life. Now you may want to pray about that, but it's a biblical concept. You see, Jesus is not just our personal Lord and Saviour. He is our Lord and Saviour. And when Jesus saved you, he saved us into a community. Yes, into a right relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, but into the family of God. And that's called the church. And to follow Jesus includes belonging to a local church, getting connected, getting into fellowship. I love Ephesians 2 and verse 19, and I'm reading it from the Living Bible where the Apostle Paul says, now you are no longer strangers, either to God and you're not foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in the household of God. You may want to put that into the chat. I belong in the household of God with every other Christian, with every other believer. And we live in an age of hyper-individualism. There's been a dramatic swing in our society, and not all of it's bad, but it's almost as gone to the extreme end of the pendulum, that the individual becomes more important than the community, the society they're in. And it's kind of a hyper-individualism that we're living in. And then we've added to this incredible dynamic during the COVID season of online church, which has been wonderful in many ways, opened all sorts of opportunities, but it has stopped that point of connection of Christian community, of fellowship. The Bible calls it cornonia. And it's so important that we recapture that, we gather that again. Paul's speaking about the body of Christ, the church, in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, talks about the incredible diversity that there was in the ancient world, and they are extremes. He says some of you were Jews, and some were Gentiles, some were slaves, and some are free. And it's like, how will that ever come together? But then he says, but you have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. And that word baptized means to be immersed, to be saturated. It's not just like dunking a donut in your coffee, which some of you are probably doing right now as you watch online. But it's that whole thing of being saturated, immersed. When we say yes to Jesus, our sins are forgiven. He becomes Lord of our life. But in that same transaction, He places us into His body, the church, sealed by the Spirit of God. Jesus saved you. You are important to Him as an individual. But He also placed you into a community of faith, a local church. And he did that so you could learn to love, to encourage, to forgive, to correct, to be corrected, to believe together, to grow together as you follow Jesus. You're an individual and God celebrates that. But you need a family of faith to belong to and in which you can grow. And in this COVID season, that's one of the things that have been most challenged, that opportunity to gather together, to grow together. As I said, online church is amazing, but it doesn't lead to community, a community of believers. And yes, we can do some things online, Zoom gatherings and all the rest of it. Let's do that. But don't forsake the gathering of ourselves together, as the Bible says some have started to do. But if you only ever gather in an online context or watching something online, you will only experience a small percentage of the incredible transforming power of what it means to follow Jesus in community. 
And I know there's some people that go, but there's some things that I'm not missing about being around some people. But it's even in that, in the rub, in the, the, the bumping off thing of sharp edges, that God grows you, that God stretches you, that God asks of you to do certain things. You need to be in a literal community, not just a virtual one. And it's in community you begin to experience the love and the fullness of God through other believers. Yes, still your relations with God, vital and important. It's in the loving. It's in the supporting of one another. It's in the praying. And yes, even in the struggling of trying to get on with some people, that real growth takes place, real transformation, and Christ gets formed in you. Again, coming back to 1 Corinthians 12, this incredible chapter where Paul talks about the body of Christ, the church. He says, the human body has many parts and many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ, which you are, which we are, all different. And as you read through this chapter, Paul actually puts forward two key propositions. He says, as members of Christ's body, You cannot say, I'm not needed. You cannot say, my gift is too small, too insignificant. My contribution is unnoticed. No, he says, every part of the body, the significant and even the so-called hidden things, the vulnerable things, add up to the human body. And he says, so too is it with the body of Christ. So you cannot say, I'm not needed. And you cannot say to somebody else, I don't need you. Listen to these two verses, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 and following. And he's almost appealing to the ridiculous that a child in Sunday school would get. He says, the foot cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And he appeals to this thing that's almost comical, but we get the point. I know some of us, as we got up this morning, struggled to get all parts of our body to cooperate and head in the same direction. But imagine, literally, if your foot just went off and said, I'm not going to church today. I'm not going to go to the kitchen and get a cup of coffee while I watch Pastor Sean. I'm just going to do my own thing today. He says, your body doesn't like act like that. He says, so don't, as part of the body of Christ, start acting like that. And then verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 12. But I can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Verse 14 says, if the foot says I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, it does not make it any less a part of the body. Those two things, you cannot say I'm not needed, you're a part of the body. And you cannot say to another part, I don't need you. And so I want to talk about what I need from you and what you need from me, and what we need from every other member of this community of faith. I'm going to start off with one of the most important things. I need your forgiveness. Paul talks about being clothed with certain garments, the garment of love in Colossians 3 verse 12 through 14. And he says, put on then as God's chosen ones. I love that. He's kind of looking into your face and saying, you need to understand you are chosen of God. You are special. You have an incredible life to live, gifts to use, possibilities to explore. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, Put on kindness, put on humility, put on meekness and patience. And then this little phrase that I think gets lost, bearing with one another, he's inferring, he says, I know sometimes in this thing called the body of Christ in church, there's clashes, there's awkward moments, awkward people, and sometimes you're the awkward person. And he says, you just got to bear with one another. Give each other a bit of space. Make room for each other's humanity and their brokenness. 
And if anyone has a complaint against another, just unfriend them on Facebook, post something mean on Instagram about them, get into a texting war. He says, no, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. Above all these, put on love and that binds everything together in perfect harmony. See, forgiveness is a big thing in our lives, whether we're talking about church or family, work experience, whatever it is. Because when there's a need to forgive, first of all, there was pain that was experienced. Pain and disappointment caused more people to disconnect from the body of Christ, from the church here on planet Earth, probably than anything else. And maybe you carrying certain pain and disappointment in your heart and life. But without forgiveness, there's no authentic relationship. And without authentic relationship, there's no community. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and following about a man who caused the Corinthian church extraordinary pain. And notice he starts off with that. He acknowledges the pain. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, Not to put it too severely. He's caused it to all of you. This man caused you pain. And he says, for such a one, this punishment, and the punishment was that of isolation, fitting for this time they were living in. They isolated him. This isolation, this punishment from the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive him and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. And this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you're obedient in everything. Without digressing, forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. It's a step of obedience in following Jesus. I'm willing to forgive in obedience to Christ, the one who has forgiven me. The second thing I need is I need your example. The example of how you do life, how you struggle with problems, how you overcome. And yes, sometimes even to learn from each other's failures. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, explains why the Old Testament exists. And when you read the Old Testament, it is filled with amazing stories, but some of them are good, some of them are bad, and some of them are just real ugly stories of terrible behaviour by human beings. And some of them people who said they loved God. And he says, these things happen to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the ends of the world, the age has come. And he's saying, when you read it, read the story of a human being who's struggling to obey God, who's made mistakes and he's trying to come back, who's made terrible decisions, but maybe trying to turn around. Or maybe somebody who started making a small decision and ended up going completely off the rails. They're there for us to learn. And similarly, in fellowship, we learn from each other. And one of the most powerful things is when you're struggling with somebody and somebody says, I can pray for you. I've been through that. He has a bit of advice. Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise your youth. I remember many, many years ago when that passage of scripture leapt out at me when I was still young. Now, in a sense, I've got to read it. Let no one despise your middle age. I'm being generous to myself here. But what excuse would I come up with? What excuse would you come up with? And he says, whatever that is, don't use an excuse, but you become an example to other believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Seek to please God first, but share your life with people, not just your words. Share your life with people. Don't just share your words. And words are helpful and important. Continue to invest in others, despite whatever difficulties and challenges may come along. And that's why I started with the thought, I need your forgiveness. 
Continually to continue to be a person that encourages others to walk with Jesus. The third thing, and it's the final one this morning, I'm gonna follow on next Sunday, is I need your prayers. And you, you might go, oh, we know, we, we know Pastor Sean. <laughs> but I'm talking about all of us, we need each other's prayers. James, and just, I'm going to read it, but why don't you reread it at his home? It's kind of homework. James 5, 16 and following, confess and acknowledge how you've offended one another and then pray for one another to be instantly healed for tremendous power is released to the passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. And then he uses the example of Elijah. Elijah was a man with human frailties, just like all of us. He wasn't a superhero. He did extraordinary things in the power and the might of the Lord. But he had human frailties just like us. Read his story and you'll see his frailties. But he prayed and received supernatural answers. There's something about when believers pray one for another, even in brokenness, in pain and hurt, where God releases supernatural power into a situation. Sometimes our prayers, I think, are a little fluffy. How about praying this one for other believers? Second Thessalonians 1 and following. So keep on praying. So we keep on praying for you, asking God to enable you to live a life worthy of His call. May He give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. And I believe there's people today listening to this message that your faith is prompting you to do something courageous, start that business, do that thing, enter that aspect of ministry, do whatever it is, that thing that is courageous, that faith is to, and I'm praying for you, that you would live a life worthy, you would live up to that prompting of faith and be courageous Courageous and do something extraordinary for God because you were willing to step out in faith and there were people around you praying. Beloved, I pray that you are prospering in every way and that you'll continue to enjoy health just as your soul is prospering. Just a few prayers. But as I land this, there's another aspect of need. And we're not talking about being needy, but I need oxygen, I need water, I need food. There's nothing wrong with those things. And Jesus says to the church at Laodicea, you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing. Not realising, and it's kind of before God, you're wretched, you're pitiable, you're poor, naked and blind. And Jesus is addressing a church at Laodicea that was a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy community. It was so wealthy that after an earthquake in AD 60, which almost destroyed most of the city, they refused help from Rome to rebuild it. They said, we've got enough, we're fine. And that kind of arrogance, that kind of self-sufficiency, you notice the repeated, I am, I have, I need nothing made them blind to the fact that before God, they were sinners just like the rest of us. They were broken. A holy God and unholy people and something has to happen to connect that. And some people say, I don't need Jesus. No, you do. You do. And He loves you. He laid down His life for you. He's got plan and purpose for you. He wants to help you in the every day of your life and He wants to secure your eternity. Let me just say those three things. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. He wants to help you in your every day to strengthen you, to give you wisdom, to lead you. And He wants to secure your eternity because you'll either spend eternity with Jesus or apart from Him. And that alienation, total separation from Jesus is what the Bible calls hell. Living for eternity without the God that loves you, that cares for you, that sent His Son to die for you. And you can say, well, I don't need anything. 
or you can say, actually, I do need Jesus. Jesus.